But if you just pour it just a little bit, it spills off the side. And so some size of Q is needed. But if your Q is bigger than what you actually need, all you oops, I keep doing this, all you do is incur additional delay on the screen. So this problem has been known about for a really long time. It hasn't been solved. There was dozens and dozens of algorithms tried. Today a little demo. You guys want to come up. We're going to try to go through them as fast as possible with some physical simulations. Now, one of the core things that TCP and all network protocols do is that okay, is that they uh, provide that signaling loop. Uh, ben Jacobson and his, how many of you did your homework? Who watched Ben Jacobson's presentation last night? I saw a few people. I saw some of the homework there. Okay, so we put up uh, a wonderful presentation of Ben Jacobson at IATF. I highly recommend it. He's a better talker than I am. And he uses a wonderful analogy of a fountain. So where the signaling happens is that water goes in, water goes out, and achieves a perfect flow balance relative to your bandwidth. The thing is, it's kind of hard to emulate a fountain with volunteers. So we're using gravity. Two volunteers in Ariana. So thank you very much for volunteering. And we're going to go through what Q behavior actually looks like. So I'm going to start with what we call standard drop tail Q. Let's see. And try to walk through it. So I'd like one of you to hold on to this one. And one of you, this is different from our original thing here. Okay, let me do that one again. You're going to hold that. And you're going to pour water into it slowly as I talk. <laughs> if you want to face the screen while I keep my bullet points or listen closely, we're good. So a drop tail cube will go ahead, will fill. Oops, we forgot something. This represents the effect of BQL uh, thing in thing at one. There's that's better. A little bit lower so you don't spill. So you're pouring packets into a classic drop tail cube. You pour and pour and you stop because you've lost packets. The top of your cube is overflowed. Now that signal of the packet overflowing has to go through the entire process and back up into the signaling person, or otherwise known as this TCP stream. <laughs> and that starts to slowly fill up and stops. And this gives you the classic TCP sawtooth behavior. And then you wait for the Q to drain. Now that's an example of one TCP stream. Our networks are significantly more complex than that. And what you typically often see is someone testing, I made one TCP stream work really well. And that's not the real world. The real world has things like DNS and DHCP and other small signaling packets, which I will get to as soon as this particular queue drains. Great. So I've already covered two of these parts of the slide, and one from there. Great. Now, when we designed the internet in the first place, what we used TCP for was for long duration file transfer. We transferred really big files from one end of the country to the other from supercomputer center to supercomputer center. And that was good. And we worked on all kinds of interesting algorithms, such as Reno and Vegas and, and Cubic, to make that process work really well in case of occasional spurious packet loss and so on, as well as back off when it encountered congestion on the line from other TCP streams. So uh, these algorithms work wonderfully throughout the 1980s because we had a scary defining event. In 1985, it was then known as the ARPANET and the internet as we know it today, it collapsed. The early TCP algorithm took a network that was capable of 100, uh, 128 KB per second and reduced it to where it was only capable of uh, transmitting 40 bits per second. The internet went down. 
Now, back then, it was just a couple hundred machines on it, so it didn't matter so much. A whole bunch of people were publishing papers and trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, Matt Jacobson and Phil Karn uh, stumbled across a really simple answer, uh, which is an algorithm called TCP slow start and Nagel's algorithm. And those two algorithms, once they were poured into source code, fixed a whole bunch of machines. And I was just a kid then, sitting in a computer room at one in the morning, waiting for my Usenet news to come back up and my email to work again. Didn't work. So the assist admins went, hey, you got the hands tape. Here, you want a copy? <laughs> Give it to your friends. And by distributing the tape of the fixed code to TCP all around the world via mail, they brought the internet back up three months after it collapsed. And then it's postal. <laughs> <laughs> they had to use postal mail, <laughs> shipping tapes. <laughs> the internet only had a couple hundred machines on it. I got concerned about buffer load when I, well, it's a long story, but I got seriously concerned about it when I was able to duplicate this kind of congestion collapse on Wi Fi networks that I had set up in my lab at Internet Systems Consortium on a regular basis, really easy. And we started to collect a lot of interesting data saying this was happening on Wi-Fi a lot. So we had to characterize TCP traffic in order for me to talk to the next one. So TCP has large, long-duration flows. They are called elephants. They're really, really, really big. They use all the bandwidth available. Then we have mice. Mice are really, really, really short flows uh, where your typical web transaction is you click on an image, and the image is 30K. And that comes right down. Or a web page itself may only be a couple K in length. And that means that the TCP transfer never escapes the slow start portion of the algorithm. A typical web page consists of dozens or even hundreds of separate TCP mice flows. And in all that overall bias that happened for uh, trying to make sure you could get data from supercomputer center to supercomputer center really, really fast. People kind of forgot about what we are now calling ANTS. Uh, there's a bunch of backronyms for that, but basically, without the ANTS recycling things, we would not have a functional ecosystem or internet. So ANTS are really simple things like a TCP SYN packet session initiation, as well as a DNS, which is translating a web page uh, name into an IP address. Uh, DHCP, which goes out and gives your machine an address for the first time. And a little other things you may care about, voice over IP, video conferencing, and internet radio. And I hope you guys play some internet games. Yes? Okay. Well, latency kills. So, the typical web page, as I was just saying, consists of dozens and dozens of DNS lookups. That is a single packet, one packet only, for each one of those. Most of the time, we have a cache architecture for that. Um, so those are cached. You don't have to go all the way to the internet to get them, but if you have a cache disk, you have to go out to the nearest name server. There are hundreds of, of millions of name servers on the internet. Then you have a TCP session initiation, which is again a single packet, which then gets a single packet in response. Then you have the HTTP request, which is a single packet containing the information. And then you start the actual TCP transfer, which contains anywhere between 1 kbytes to hundreds of megabytes. Then it ends, and the process repeats until the web page is loaded. Now, web browsers, because they are one of the most foundational technologies we currently use, try really hard to optimize this process. And because we have zillions of different kinds of web uh, links in a given web page, Web browsers typically open up six or more simultaneous connections and issue a whole bunch of DNS requests as close to as in parallel as they can. However, due to the interaction and congestion control algorithms, they don't actually uh, start up uh, if they can. They try to limit the number of TCP streams that they start because of the interaction with the slow start algorithm. So if you can open up one stream that loads five images for you, that's better because it ramps up quicker Pass will start into using the amount available bandwidth on the link. Now, Google and others are working on a new 
TCP fast open, uh, which is now in the next 3.6 and 3.7. Uh, it is a IETF standard, so they hope to actually skip the SYNC process uh, on new connections as well. The numbers on that are saying, will they improve throughput by throughput and latency by about 12%. So, we go back to playing with another physical demonstration of how a typical web page might actually work. So, if you would grab yourselves two large bottles of water, we'll put this here. Make sure it's good. All right. Now you're just going to pour into one bottle here. Okay, just the one bottle. Both the act, both yeah, so um, both of you are pouring water, but both of you are going to pour in. Stop. much, much smaller queues. 